Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Parkinson's disease and the anti-Parkinson drugs. Okay, right, so we're going to start off by discussing the first line treatment for Parkinson's disease then, okay, which is levodopa, okay, which is also called L-dopa. Now this drug literally is the L-dopa that we saw earlier. It's the larvorotatory enantiomer of this dopa molecule, the dihydroxyphenylalanine, which is the precursor to dopamine. Okay, right, so how does this help then in Parkinson's disease? Well, there are two theories as to why L-dopa helps, okay, or two theories as to how it works. It's pretty obvious how it might help, okay, but there are two theories as to how it works, and we don't know which of these is correct. So one option is that the L-dopa is uptaken by the dopaminergic neurons of the nigrostriatal pathway. Okay, so it's uptaken by, whoops, uptaken by dopamine neurons. Okay, uh, and this is the remaining dopamine neurons. So remember, even in Parkinson's disease, not quite all of the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia niagara pars compactor are going to degenerate. Some of them will still be there. Okay, so the idea is that the remaining ones are going to now take up the drug L-dopa, okay, and then in their axon terminals, so I'll draw the axon terminal here, they're going to convert the L-dopa into dopamine, okay, so they're now going to have more dopamine, okay, they're going to store this dopamine in their synaptic vesicles, so if I draw their synaptic vesicles, these synaptic vesicles are going to end up full up of dopamine, okay, like so, and then these remaining dopaminergic neurons will then release these synaptic vesicles full of dopamine and then they're going to be releasing now more dopamine and therefore that's going to make up for the dopaminergic neurons that have been lost. That's one theory of how L-dopa works. There is however another theory which I think is gaining popularity over this theory here, okay? And this other theory is that other cells of the brain besides the remaining dopaminergic neurons, okay, are going to take up the L-dopa and they're going to convert it into dopamine and then this dopamine is going to be released into the extracellular fluid causing dopamine to go up in the extracellular fluid all over the brain basically and that includes in the dorsal striatum so this is also going to lead to dopamine going up in the dorsal striatum okay and then we understand what happens after that dopamine going up in the dorsal striatum whether it's because the dopaminergic neurons that are remaining are now releasing more dopamine or whether it's because other cells of the brain are now producing and releasing dopamine uh, whichever is the case the increased dopamine in the dorsal striatum is then going to activate the D1 and the D2 receptors on the medium spiny neurons of the direct and indirect pathways respectively okay and that's going to be pro movement so D1 receptors on the direct pathway medium spiny neurons are going to make them more excitable okay which will uh, make the direct pathway more excitable, okay, and uh, that means that you're going to have, find it easier to initiate movements, and in addition, the D2 receptors on the indirect medium spiny neurons are going to inactivate those ones, they're going to make it more difficult to excite those uh, medium spiny neurons of the indirect pathway, and that means you're going to tone down the indirect pathway, which remember is anti-movement, that's stopping the permission signal going uh, to the uh, cerebral cortex. Okay, so this then is going to make movement more easy. Okay, and it really does. When you take L-dopa, it is fantastic. It makes the hypokinesia, which remember means the difficulty in initiating voluntary movements, it makes that go away completely. Okay, sorry, I've misspelt it. Hypokinesia. So that hypokinesia will go down. Okay, right. Now, L-dopa is generally not given alone. Instead, it's given in combination with other drugs. Okay, now the common ones that are usually given alongside L-dopa are either carbidopa, okay, or benzerazide. Okay, now what do these two drugs do? Well, let me firstly explain the problem uh, with uh, giving L-dopa firstly. Okay, so the problem is that 
loads of other cells all around your body can convert L-dopa into dopamine. Okay, so let me draw a little picture here. So we'll have a stick man. Okay, so here's the head, and here it are the legs. Okay, so we want L-dopa to be going to the brain and being converted into dopamine. Okay, the problem is that all the other tissues of the body can also take up L-dopa, and they can also convert it into dopamine. Now, we don't want that. Now, the tissues of the peripheral body, they take L-dopa, and they convert it to dopamine using um, the uh, same enzyme as is used in axon terminals, i.e. the dopa decarboxylase enzyme, or the L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. Okay, so why don't we inhibit this enzyme, dopa decarboxylase? Well, this is exactly what carbidopa and benzeracide do. They inhibit dopa decarboxylase. Now, you might be saying, hang on a moment, you can't just do that, because now the L-dopa is going to be totally useless, because even if it gets into the brain, it now can't be converted to dopamine. Okay, but this is the genius of this. These drugs cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so not uh, blood-brain barrier permeable. Okay, so they can't get into the brain, however they can go everywhere else in the body. So everywhere else in the body, these drugs are going to block dopa decarboxylase and stop L-dopa being converted to dopamine in the peripheral tissues. Okay, that means that cells are going to stop uptaking L-dopa because they're just going to accumulate it and not be able to actually convert it into anything. Okay, then we will have more L-dopa left over to go to the brain, okay, and now in the brain, these drugs can't get into the brain, so we can now convert this into dopamine, and then we've got the dopamine that we need to remove the hypokinesia problems that result from having too low dopamine in the dorsal striatum. Okay, right, so that's why carbidopa or benzeracide are usually used uh, with levodopa. In addition, you can also give the drug entucapone as well, which further helps to uh, prevent the um, peripheral breakdown of levodopa. So entucapone, capone. Okay, right. So entucapone, what does entucapone do? Well, entucapone is an inhibitor of catechol-omethyl transferase. Okay, so another problem with giving L-dopa is that the liver is capable of breaking down L-dopa. Okay, so hepatocytes, I'll draw one here, have a lot uh, of catecholomethyl transferase, both forms of catecholomethyl transferase. So both the soluble catecholomethyl transferase, which will be floating around their cells, okay, and then also the membrane-bound catecholomethyl transferase, which will be on their uh, membranes. Okay, and of course, uh, these two forms of catecholomethyl transferase, not only can they break down dopamine, but they can also break down L-dopa. Okay, uh, so we don't want these enzymes metabolizing the L-dopa before it's actually been able to get to the brain. Okay, so what entucapone does is it blocks the uh, catecholomethyl transferase enzymes in the uh, hepatocytes. Now, once again, entucapone is not capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier, so it's not going to block COMT in the brain. You might think that, well, wouldn't that be a good idea, blocking COMT in the brain, because it um, breaks down dopamine, it will break down the old dopa, presumably, when you put that in, okay? Uh, but you but you don't need to, basically, okay? What you want to do is block the liver ones, okay? And that's what entucapone does. So entucapone does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So you might think that it would be a good idea to block COMT in the brain as well, but that's not what this drug does. It just blocks the peripheral uh, COMT enzymes, okay? And hence prevents the breakdown of the drug by the liver, or at least to some extent. Okay, right.
So um, let's talk a little bit more then about L-Dopa therapy. So L-Dopa therapy is absolutely brilliant at first. It works fantastically. It reduces the hypokinesia right down and these people who previously were having a horrendous time initiating movements, suddenly they can walk again like they could previously. Okay, uh, so it is a fantastic drug when you first take it. The problem is that generally it does stop working over the years as you continue to take it. Okay, and this is believed to be because it doesn't stop the neurodegeneration, it just replaces the dopamine. Okay, and as the neurodegeneration continues on, uh, the disease is going to progress and get worse, and levodopa is not going to stop that. And eventually, uh, it seems that the neurodegeneration gets so bad that levodopa can't uh, get rid of the hypokinesia anymore. Okay, in addition, levodopa also has pharmacokinetic problems as well. Okay, so let me explain these pharmacokinetic problems. Okay, so basically the pharmacokinetic problems with levodopa are that uh, it is removed from the body far too quickly. Okay, its half-life is far too short. Okay, so basically if we plot one of these graphs where we plot drug concentration, okay, so let's say that this is how much drug we've got in the blood versus time, okay, what you get is graphs that look like this. When you take the drug, the drug concentration goes right up. So let's say it's right down initially. Okay, when you take the drug, it goes right up and then it falls right down and then you take another dose of the drug and it goes right up and then it falls right down. So your drug levels are not very stable, okay? Now, when you have very high levels of the drug in your blood, that correlates to having very high levels of dopamine within the dorsal striatum. Now, what happens when you have very high dopamine levels within the dorsal striatum? Okay, well, it makes movement very, very easily. But the problem is if you get too much dopamine in the dorsal striatum, it lets through all sorts of movements. It gives permission to all sorts of motor plans that you don't want to give permission to. Okay, so it lets through loads of movements that you don't actually want to let through. Okay, and this is what's known as dyskinesia. So when you're on one of these spikes of L-dopa, it can cause dyskinesia. Now, it doesn't cause this in everyone, but in quite a few patients, it causes dyskinesias. Now, what what do I mean by this? Well, let me give you some examples. You end up with writhing movements, okay, involuntary writhing movements, okay, particularly of the hands and the face, okay, hands and face and the neck, okay, uh, so writhing movements basically, particularly of the face and the neck, okay, um, so that's because you're letting through all sorts of motor plans which you had no voluntary intention of actually letting through. Motor plans that have just been made haphazard by the secondary motor cortex but were never actually supposed to be initiated. But if dopamine is too high, then you let through motor plans that weren't supposed to be initiated. So that's the problem with levodopa. Because of its bad pharmacokinetics, it peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs. So when you're on a peak, you start getting dyskinesias, or at least some people start getting dyskinesias, okay? And then you go into a trough, okay? So you have a period where it's brilliant, okay? And you've got normal uh, voluntary movement initiation, and then you go into a trough, and then you get hypokinesia again. So you've got too little dopamine, and now you've got your hypokinesia again where you just can't initiate movements again. Okay, so that's the problem. Problem. That's one of the major problems with levodopa, this peaking and troughing, which is a pharmacokinetic problem fundamentally. What we would like is if we could keep dopamine levels, or rather keep the drug levels, steady like so. Okay, but you can only do that with drugs that have very slow uh, removal time, basically, a slow half-life. Okay, right. Uh, so that then uh, is all I'm going to say about levodopa. Let's now turn our attention on to other drugs that can be used to treat Parkinson's disease besides uh, levodopa. Okay, right. So, levodopa therapy focused on trying to increase the amount of dopamine in the uh, dorsal striatum. However, 
why do we need to actually increase the dopamine in the dorsal striatum? Why don't we just actually create a drug that activates the D1 and D2 receptors directly? Because that's all that dopamine was actually doing, it was activating those receptors. Why don't we just create a drug that does that for us? Okay, so the next type of anti-Parkinson drug are the dopamine agonists, okay? which are drugs which are going to bind to the dopamine receptors and activate them. Okay, so firstly, we have the drugs which are both D1 agonists and D2 agonists. So they're going to both activate the sensitivity of the direct pathway and inactivate the sensitivity of the indirect pathway. Okay, so they're going to do both of the things that dopamine does within the dorsal striatum. Okay, right, so the two example drugs that I have as dopamine 1 and dopamine 2 receptor agonists are firstly bromocryptine, okay, which is an old drug used to treat Parkinson's disease, okay, and then also pergolide. Okay, so bromocryptine and pergolide are both non-selective dopamine agonists for both D1 and D2 receptors. And this kind of cuts out the middle rubbish with do trying to raise dopamine levels. We can just do it directly. Now, um, dopamine agonists are not the first-line treatment for Parkinson's disease. Levodopa is. Okay, but if levodopa fails, then you can go on to dopamine agonists. Okay, right. Uh, now, newer dopamine agonists just activate the D2 receptors rather than the D1 receptors, which means that they just focus on this inactivation of the sensitivity of the indirect pathway rather than activating the direct pathway. Okay, and these seem to be effective in um, helping the initiation of movement as well, so it doesn't seem that you actually do need that sensitization of the direct pathway. It's enough to just inactivate the sensitivity of the indirect pathway and that also has the uh, pro-movement effect. Okay, so examples of D2 agonists used to treat Parkinson's disease are pramipazole, okay, pramipazole, and also rapinarol, okay, so pramipazole and rapinarol. Okay, right. So these just work by doing exactly what dopamine does without actually replacing the dopamine. Okay, the final type of anti-Parkinson drug that I want to talk about then is monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. Okay, and these drugs are selective for monoamine oxidase B. They only inhibit monoamine oxidase B rather than just uh, inhibiting monoamine oxidase A and B. Okay, so... Uh, examples of monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, and then I'll tell you the reasoning behind why these work. Okay, so you've got saligiline, okay, and then also rasagiline. Okay, so both of these drugs selectively inhibit monoamine oxidase B. Now, why is that helpful? Well, this action truly is in the uh, dopaminergic neurons that have managed to survive the Parkinson's disease. Okay, so if we bring back our dopaminergic axon here, okay, uh, in the dopamine neurons that have survived the degeneration, okay, if you inhibit monoamine oxidase B, then you're going to get more dopamine actually making it into synaptic vesicles because less of the dopamine that you're synthesizing will be destroyed by the monoamine oxidase B. Okay, therefore your synaptic vesicles are going to end up stuffed full of dopamine, okay, which means that when these dopaminergic neurons do release dopamine into uh, the dorsal striatum, they're now going to release more dopamine. Okay, so you're going to increase dopaminergic transmission in the dorsal striatum, and that's going to help uh, produce m this pro-movement effect, okay, so that uh, initiating voluntary movements becomes easier. Okay, right. So, all of these anti-Parkinson drugs, I will say it again, are fantastic at treating the hypokinesia associated with Parkinson's disease, okay, because that truly does result from the lack of dopamine in the dorsal striatum, but they are less good at treating the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which result from wider neurodegeneration of the brain, okay, and they also do nothing to stop the degeneration that is occurring within the brain.
Okay, so that concludes now our discussion of Parkinson's disease and the anti-Parkinson drugs.